Hey, guess what? We're in the last section of Exodus. Almost finished. You know, I was, it was a bit of a surprise to me that I actually was looking forward to this last section. Because I don't know if you've read it, the final 15 chapters of Ex- Exodus, but 25 to 40 to the end. Uh, but all 15 of them, barring one, all 15 barring one are about a tent, right? Uh, a tent in the desert called the tabernacle. Right, um, here's a modern day reconstruction of it. It's quite a large tent, but it's a tent nonetheless. It's all about how to make it, what to put in it, what to do once you've put the stuff in it. Uh, if you read it, I wouldn't blame you for wondering what on earth has this got to do with anything today? Well, it's a good question, and that's maybe a good reason why we might preach on it, right? Uh, now, I had two options I realized as I came to these uh, 15 chapters. I thought, firstly, I could take a few verses at a time, you know, half a chapter at the most at a time, and sort of work through it bit by bit, all the details, and really grapple with what's going on uh, with this tabernacle, uh, these tabernacle chapters. And I calculated that would be about 30 or 40 weeks of preaching. Uh, Probably we might be done by next Easter. Uh, Or I thought we could uh, pull out the big ideas of, of these chapters, of the tabernacle, match key passages, and then do a four-week mini-series to finish Exodus, right? Uh, you should be thankful that I've decided the second one, right? You should be thankful that I have a, you have a discerning uh, minister to make good choices for you. So that decided, uh, what do we call this mini-series, this four-week mini-series? What do we call it? So I thought about uh, building a tent in the desert. So that might be a bit dry. Uh, or maybe... Ecclesiology, Numerology and Theophany of the Tabernacle Construction. How's that? Would that get you kind of interested and engaged in these chapters? Oh, there's some nods. Okay, we'll go with that then. Which one do you want to start with? Ecclesiology, Numerology or Theophany? <laughs> okay, I don't think so. So what then? What do we call this mini-series? Uh, if you've been following, we've been going through Exodus, uh, of course, and we have called it Set Free. Set free, and we started off set free from slavery as we uh, learned about the story of the Israelites being set free from the Egyptians and being brought out uh, from under the yoke of the Egyptians from slavery, uh, brought out to follow, and that was the next series, to follow uh, the Lord through the desert, um, through the wilderness as he, as he took them towards the promised land. Uh, so what... Is this one all about? Set free to do what? We're still in the set free Exodus series. Set free to do what? And I realized it was set free to worship. Pure and simple. Set free to worship. Because if it wasn't for this tent, this tabernacle in the desert uh, that God tells the Israelites to make, they wouldn't know how really to worship. They wouldn't know how really to worship this God who had saved them. And we'll, we'll, we'll see that take shape through this series we're doing. But let's think about worship for just a moment. Um, we, I think we often sell ourselves short when we talk about worship, about understanding of worship. You know, it might, we kind of think it might be only that time we stand on a mountaintop or stand at the beach at a sunset and we kind of worship God in that moment. You know, we, we go, praise you, Lord, and uh, uh, holy, you're awesome. Uh, that's when we worship. That's what we call worship. Or, or we kind of think of it as, you know, we have the worship team here or worship songs. Or we say this, we're going to enter a time of worship when we go to sing. We kind of end up splitting this idea of worship off and, and tightly defining it. And we restrict it, don't we, to certain aspects of our life or what we do. You know, I think we need to enlarge our view of worship this morning and through this series because that's what we're going to be looking at. Worship is more than what we do when we sing certain songs. It's more than what we do on Sundays. It's more than just praising God on a mountaintop or at the beach. In fact, it's all of life, all of life. It's acknowledging God in all we do. It's responding in the right way and the only way to a God who is so good, so great, so holy, so faithful. Psalm 96.9 says, Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. And I love the definition of the 1828 
Webster Dictionary, which says, Worship is to honour with extravagant love and extreme submission. Worship is to honour with extravagant love and extreme submission. Man, there's so much in there about what worship really is. There's a, 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 a woman, in, a pastor, she's a pastor, author, and a colourful uh, radio presenter in the States for kids' programmes and all sorts of things, quite um, a, a range of uh, things. She says this about, in response to this definition. True worship, she says, in other words, is defined by the priority we place on who God is in our lives and where God is on our list of priorities. True worship is a matter of the heart expressed through a lifestyle of holiness. Thus, if your lifestyle does not express the beauty of holiness through an extravagant or exaggerated love for God, and you do not live in extreme or excessive submission to God, she goes on to say, then I invite you to make worship a non-negotiable priority in your life. You see, what all this is pointing to is that worship is life. If you accept Jesus as Lord, as Saviour, then it's time to worship, you see. Because God calls us through faith to turn all our life over to him, to give him proper place, to worship in the beauty of holiness, to honour him with extravagant love and extreme submission. How do you honour how do you honour God with extravagant love and extreme submission? How do you worship God? It's helpful to think about this. We will probably all find different avenues or different ways that we more naturally worship God through what we do or, or involved in. And something that might help us, in fact, uh, it's what's become known as the pathways to worship. You might have come across it. Um, and they list these ways that we might uh, worship given our gifts and our, our natural um, f our faith works. Uh, relational, naturalist or creation, contemplative, creative, serving, intellectual and activist. Now this is just a tool, it's not exhaustive, but um, what we're going to do through this series is to help us sort of understand what worship is and connect it with the Exodus account of the tabernacle is we're going to interview uh, each week somebody that more naturally kind of slots into one of these pathways. And so we'll be doing that soon. Brad will be back. Uh, so watch this space. I also want, to, want you to listen to the words of Jesus as he talks about worship. John 4, 21 to 24. Jesus replies to the Samaritan woman that he meets and he says uh, that questions about what worship is and where they worship. Um, he says this, Believe me, the hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem Will you worship the Father? But the hour is coming and is now here when true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking such people to worship him. Jesus is enlarging our view of worship here too, isn't he? It's more than a place or a certain way of doing things. He's showing and telling us here that his spirit and his truth guides us and helps us to honour him with extravagant love and extreme submission. And although we might have certain pathways, if you like, or ways that we more naturally connect and worship, that we naturally slot into, the idea here really, surely, is that worship also applies to every single thing we do. Every single second, every single conversation, every single action, every single breath of our lives is an act of worship. If we know God through Jesus, then it's time to worship. So what does the tabernacle, this great big tent in Exodus, have to do with this? I can hear you asking that. Well, that's what we're going to look at over the next four weeks, uh, because what we find is the tabernacle in a very real and tangible, visible way defined how the people were to do this, to worship in all their life. And so we're going to look at four aspects, really, of this idea of being set free to worship that we can see really clearly in 
these 15 chapters on the tabernacle. And these four aspects are going to be presence, Jesus, approach, and response. And I think already you can hear how these are going to apply to us. So don't switch off today or the next four weeks. Right. Today, though, we're going to look at presence. Um, presence, God's presence with his people. Because this is, in fact, key to understanding the tabernacle, understanding this tent that God wants built. And it's key, really, to understanding worship. God wants to dwell with his people. And so he makes sure there is a way to do that so that they, so that we, can worship him. We just read the very first passage in this uh, series, in this, these chapters, start of chapter 25, where it starts the process of saying we need stuff to build this tabernacle. And we will be looking at that more um, in the next weeks. But at the end of that passage, there's a key verse which pretty much sets, gets to the heart of why these 15 chapters are being written. Chapter, uh, chapter 25 verse 8 says, Then have them make this sanctuary, this tabernacle, for me, and I will dwell among them. I will dwell among them. You see, we could say the whole point of these 15 chapters is exactly this, to make a place, a tent, so that God could come down and live amongst his people. This is amazing, right, when you think about it, what God's doing here. A holy, perfect God wants to come and live amongst an unholy, imperfect people. But if you think about it, this is just a carry-on of what God's been doing in the story so far, the Exodus story. And remember, this is a reflection, as we've been talking about, a reflection of the gospel story. Uh, remember, God's rescued them already out of Egypt. He's brought them safely across the Red Sea. He said, follow me, and I will be your God. You will be my people. And then he, he brought them, as he promised, to Mount Sinai. And there in the, in the cloud and the glory, uh, glory of the Lord, the thunder and lightning, God's presence appeared. And he spoke to the people through Moses, chapter 19 of Exodus. And he again said, I will be your God and you will be my people. He made a covenant with them. This is relationship. And now in these final 15 chapters of Exodus, he is going to great lengths and great detail to make sure that he can continue this very thing that he started, this relationship with his people that he's saved, that he's redeemed, to continue what he's already established with his people, continue being present with them, continue leading them on as his people, continue pointing them to the promised land and the hope that he gives them. And so the whole design and the whole all the instructions that come in these chapters of how to build the tabernacle, what to use, what to put in it, how to, build, how to make what to put in it, what should the priests do and how they should serve and how they should dress, uh, what to do when they serve in it. Everything is geared around this one thing, making a place for God to dwell, making a place that a holy, unapproachable God can actually be approached. And just a quick flick through the chapters following chapter 25 uh, shows this. Uh, we see in chapter 26, it explains how to construct the tabernacle. And we'll look a bit more in terms of the, the, the court and the holy place and the inner place where God dwells a bit more later in the series. Um, tw chapter 27 goes on uh, to explain and describe how to build the altar where the sacrifices were made for forgiveness of sins so that people could approach God and his presence. Uh, chapter 28 uh, continues and describes in a lot of detail uh, the priests and how they're set aside and made holy and, and consecrated or, and, and uh, how they should be dressed uh, uh, to serve as mediators, as go-betweens between God and his people, to, between the God who is present and the people. And so at the end of 29, we hear... Uh, sort of a, a summing up this as it, as it makes the point again. Chapter 29, verse 44. 29. It's, 
God says, So I will construct the tent of meeting and the altar, and will consecrate Aaron and his sons to serve me as priests. And then I will dwell among the Israelites and be their God. They will know that I am the Lord their God who brought them out of Egypt, so that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord their God. It's all about God's presence, you see. It's all about God making it possible to live amongst his people. And this is amazing when you understand the grace and the love of a God who would do this and the reality that he did do it. And if we go right to the end of Exodus, we see the same thing, the kind of culmination. Once the tent is built, the tabernacle is built, in chapter 40, uh, you hear the same idea of, of what happens once it's finished. Uh, it says, verse 30, end of 31, And so Moses finished the work, building the tabernacle. Then immediately it implies, uh, straight away the cloud covered the tent of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses could not enter the tent of meeting because the cloud had settled upon it, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And in all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from the tabernacle, they would set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. And so the cloud of the Lord, in other words, his presence was over the tabernacle by, excuse me, by day and fire was in the cloud by night. And the sight of all the house of Israel during all their travels. The end. Point made. God is present. He lives amongst them. And that is what we need to take from this these final chapters of Exodus as we look at today and the coming weeks. Now just think for a moment, please. If, if you were an Israelite and you discovered as you were putting up your tent uh, that in fact God was setting up camp right next to you, would you ignore that fact? Because this, this was the, how close it was for them. Every time they shifted, they had to pack up God's tent, if you like, the tabernacle. Every time they stopped, they had to set up God's tent because he dwelt amongst them. In fact, the same words used for their tents as his tent. And it might sound like I'm making light of it, but that's how close he was. If you're an Israelite, would you ignore that fact? It would be pretty difficult to. All of life would be uh, shaped around it, I think. You couldn't just sort of acknowledge, hey God, there you are, and then go on in another direction with your life as if he didn't exist or wasn't there. All of life would have been shaped around it. I think if you walked along a path in the camp, it would always lead you to the tabernacle. It was so central. God's presence was with them. In response to this, you could still say, yeah, yeah, I still don't get it though. What's the big tent got to do with us today? It's one thing for the Israelites. What about us today? I want to read you a verse that connects and helps us see where this leads us to. And it's a verse that I was, uh, it really opened my eyes to understanding uh, the truth of how God is present with us even today. John 1.14 says this, The word Christ became flesh and he made his dwelling among us. He made his dwelling among us. The word used there is actually the same word for tent or tabernacle. He made his tabernacle amongst us or he tabernacled with us. He set up tent, Jesus. The tabernacle in Exodus then is simply something that foreshadows how God would truly come and dwell among us. Truly come and live with his people. And even though Jesus has, has died and rose again and ascended again, and he's not with us in flesh now, God still made it possible, didn't he, for him to dwell amongst us. He poured out his Holy Spirit. Because now the spirit of life can dwell in those that put their faith in Christ. Why? Because through forgiveness and grace, we are made holy and a fitting dwelling place for God, the Holy Spirit. He sent his spirit into the lives of his people, and he still does 
He sets up tent, if you like. He camps amongst those who believe his presence, real, tangible, accessible, central. Listen to what the New Testament, uh, how the New Testament picks up on this and links us with the tabernacle or the temple. Remember the temple uh, replaced the tabernacle when they finally settled down in the promised land. 1 Corinthians 3.16 Do you not know that you are God's temple? He's talking to the Corinthian church. And that God's spirit dwells in you. If anyone destroys God's temple, God will destroy him. For God's temple is holy, and you are that temple. And Ephesians 2 is similar, again, to the church in Ephesus. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. And verse 18 continues, For through him, through Christ, we have, both, uh, we have access by one Spirit to the Father, to God the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself as the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows into a holy temple in the Lord. And in him you are also being built together into a dwelling place for God by his Spirit. God's people, the church, is the tabernacle in which God dwells. God still wants to be present and involved in the lives of his people so that they can rightly respond and worship him. He made it possible through the tabernacle, but the tabernacle only points us and helps us understand how he has done it through Jesus and his spirit. If you want to live in God's presence, put your faith in Christ. Give your life to him and he will give his spirit to you so that we respond in his strength and leading in worship. All our lives, he will dwell amongst us. I asked the question just earlier, what would you do if you're an Israelite setting up tent and God set up camp next to you? Now the question surely should be, what are you doing? Because God has set up camp in our very midst. If we truly grasp the mystery, the reality, the grace of this amazing thing that God does through Christ by his spirit, we will respond in worship. Like we saw for the Israelites, what else can they do? What else can we do? We will respond in worship. Because there's no other right way, surely, to respond to a God who does this sort of thing. He's not distant. He comes and dwells with his people. Of course, this response of worship does start here on on Sundays, doesn't it? We gather to worship because he is present with us when we gather as a church. I read an account Um, once about um, the church in the States where President uh, Roosevelt attended. And one morning the rector of the church got a call from someone um, asking if the president would be in in attendance at church this morning. And the rector replied, I cannot promise uh, that he'll be there. However, God will be there. And that should be incentive enough for a reasonably large attendance. And it should be, shouldn't it? The sole fact that God is present with his people should get us up every Sunday morning, even if it's an hour earlier because of daylight savings, and draw us here to what? To worship together because he's present. The sole fact that God is present when we gather should also draw others in that might not know him because they see a reflection of God's grace and mercy and holiness in our worship together. The church gathered is this full expression of the tabernacle in which God dwells. I bet if someone said that God was going to be setting up camp down at the Tahunui campground next Sunday, you'd be all there, right? You'd leave me to it, which is a good thing. You'd all be there, surely. Because we respond to God and what he's doing in our midst. We respond to his presence 
And this must define our life together of those who follow Jesus. Our worship together. And I don't just mean singing. Because he's present with us in all we do as a church, leading us on, helping us see where he wants us to go. He is right here involved with us today as we go forward, as we step out in faith. What's the point of setting a, a, a vision to know God and know him, make him known in the community? What's the point of wanting to reach out into our local community in other ways if he's not present with us, leading us on, just like he was with the Israelites, leading them on? Of course, it's not just when we are together as a, as a full church that God is present, is it? No, the, the message from these Exodus chapters and how it relates to us today is that he tabernacles with us all the time. Right? Jesus said, where two or more are gathered, there I will be. When we meet with a friend for a coffee, we meet in his presence. When we meet to open the Bible, we meet in his presence. When we get married, we get married in his presence. You probably all know the words. Before God and these witnesses, you are now man and wife. When we share our faith and talk about Jesus to others, he is there to help us do it. When we don't know what to say to comfort or to encourage someone, he is present. When we suffer, he is present. When we are rejected or lonely, he is present. When we serve and respond to his calling and serve in the drop-in centre or, or at youth group or kids club, he is present. We are responding to him and what he's doing in our lives. In everything we do, he is present. He is with us. There's a group of uh, people over at, Kaleidos, uh, over at Victory Church this morning from here, uh, a, kaleidos a kaleidoscope uh, trip to Victory to support them. Uh, we can send them off in faith and in the knowledge that he is with them as well as they serve another church. This reality should define all our life, our life together, our life as followers of Jesus. If we come and say, yes, I believe in you, Christ, you died for me, I'm yours, then it's time to start worshipping. Our whole life becomes worship in his presence. Because we are set free, set free from our bondage to sin, to this world, set free to follow and to worship the one who has done it and made it possible and chooses in his grace, to dwell amongst us, to tabernacle right here today in our midst. We can't do anything else but worship when we understand this. Let's pray. Lord, thank you that you are here. You are present. And Lord, that's not through anything that we have done. It's not like we have, it's not like we can invite you in or uh, welcome you or make things, uh, conjure up things to make it possible. You have made it possible, Lord, because you've sent your Son who did dwell amongst us, but also who died on that cross for us so that we could be made holy and pure through faith in you. And so that as a result, you would come and dwell amongst us. You'd set up tent, set up camp, and be here with us. Lord, pray that if anything stands in the way of anybody here this morning of coming to faith in you and accepting you as Saviour, and so having you dwell in their lives, you would um, push it aside, Lord. Help them commit to you, and so worship you. Lord, help each one of us to do this, to help us enlarge our understanding of worship um, and what it means to worship you with all our life, to honour you with extravagant love and extreme excessive submission. Help us to worship in spirit and in truth. 
Help us to glorify your name in all we do. Lord, we lift these prayers to you, knowing you hear our prayers because you are right here. And we have you, Christ, interceding for us. Amen.